This lecture is on Materials for Improving Environmental Quality, Polymers from Renewable Resources. This is a part of the Impact of Materials on Society series by the Materials Research Society Foundation. Polymers are ubiquitous in society, and if you think about your daily lives, you come in contact with polymers all around you, at home, at work, at school, in your cars. Polymers are used everywhere. For many reasons, including the tunability of their properties, their light weight, and also the low cost of producing them. Consider the example of parts used to manufacture automobiles. In the past, these were mainly metal components, and now primarily the components are made out of plastics. On this slide, I'm showing a number of examples of materials and products which are made out of plastics, certainly not a comprehensive list. And overall, throughout the world, about 100 billion pounds of polymers are produced every year. In the automotive industry, you can think about car parts, but I also like to point out the Toyota Prius as an example because of the battery. And many people are developing advanced membranes for batteries made out of polymers, which will greatly improve their safety. In addition, you can think about disposable materials like your ordinary plastic water bottle, packaging, cutlery, plates, that sort of thing, which are all made out of plastics. You can think about the biomedical industry. Uh, if you come in contact with uh, materials such as uh, resorbable sutures, which don't have to be removed because they're actually biodegradable. Uh, also, uh, you can think about things like advanced tissue scaffolds made out of polymers. And so many polymers are actually what we would call uh, biocompatible, which means that they will not harm uh, the human body. If you think about construction, construction and building materials, in your house there are polymers everywhere. And on the, on the slide there is a picture of foam, which is used uh, for insulation in your house. Also, electronics are very dependent on polymers, as photoresist for the silicon processing industry. So any computer that you've used or cell phone, other electronic devices all rely upon that polymer. Also, people are trying to make uh, electronics out of plastics, such as solar cells, which they're actually flexible and yet still can uh, convert the solar energy into power. Uh, finally, you could think about water filtration. Uh, the water that you drink that comes from the city is all filtered through polymer membranes, and people are making advanced membranes like the one shown on the slide, uh, which have a very uh, well-defined pore size. So basically, polymers are everywhere. And the subject of the lecture today is to think about the environmental and societal implications of polymers and plastics. And one main uh, consideration is where do all of the plastics come from? So basically, greater than 95% of the plastics that you'll come in, in contact with in your daily life are coming from petroleum oils. You can see a picture of a BP uh, petroleum processing plant on the website. And crude oil is actually processed and converted into the monomers for polymers, things like ethylene, propylene, styrene, which are uh, in many of the different products that I've mentioned, uh, which are so important to our daily lives. Uh, these monomers are then converted to plastics, which are then reprocessed and formed into the products that we purchase and we use. What happens to those plastics once we're done with them? Many of them are longer lasting products, such as the building products, which will be used for years and years. But other products, such as the water bottles that are shown on the slide, are really only used for a very short period of time. And it turns out only about 7% of the plastics produced are actually recycled. And the other 93% are ending up in other places, primarily in landfills. Uh, some end up in waterways, some end up in uh, areas on, on the ground. And so uh, we really need to think about this full life cycle of plastics. Uh, not only the question of the source, is it, a, is it a source that we can rely on per, for years into the future, but also what's the fate of the materials after they're used? Is there another way uh, that we could handle these materials and, and not fill up the landfills? Currently, many people are thinking about other alternatives to petroleum for polymers. And because polymers are basically hydrocarbons, we have to think about sources for hydrocarbons. This problem is actually very related to that of alternative energy, where people are considering solar energy, wind energy, uh, batteries, uh, all different options for 
replacing petroleum as our primary energy source. When we think about sources for materials, the scenario is a little bit more complicated because we need to find sources for hydrocarbons. And so in many cases, agricultural sources are the best option as an alternative source for plastics and polymers. Shown on the slide are lots of different types of agricultural sources, which uh, people are currently studying, both at universities and also at companies where they're actually commercializing different products made, out of, made from all of these sources. One of the most commonly encountered sources are plant sugars, and there's currently a company called NatureWorks that is commercializing the conversion of the sugars to a polymer called polylactide. You can see the pellets on the upper left-hand portion of the slide. Uh, which I'm indicating now. Many different types of products, like packaging, can be made out of polylactide, and we'll talk a little bit more about polylactide uh, later on in this lecture. Another source that are, is being considered is that of polysaccharides, which are naturally occurring polymers, such as starch and cellulose, and people can then modify those materials or can blend them with other polymers in order to make useful products. In addition, there are plant terpenes, which are a little bit more of a niche chemical uh, area, and uh, these are often used as things such as fragrances, uh, some smaller volume uh, applications, but one of the ones that's most commonly found is that of natural rubber, which is actually a polymer that is produced directly by uh, trees in a latex form and is used for things such as rubber tires. Vegetable oils are a very promising source for polymers, and that's because they are very abundant, uh, particularly in the, in the United States, and very low cost because of their abundance. And they contain uh, fatty acids, which have carbon-carbon double bonds that can be functionalized and converted into many different types of polymers. And so they're a very promising source. And there's a picture on the slide of a shape memory foam, which is actually made in part from soybean oil. And finally, there's a class of polymers, uh, which are microbial-derived polyesters. And so these are actually produced by microbes directly for energy storage. And you can see the picture on the lower right-hand side. Uh, these are actually the body of the microbe. About 90% of this volume is filled with that polymer. And so then that polymer can be harvested. It can be converted into various types of plastics. In many cases, these polyesters have very similar properties to that of polylactide. So with all of these options, uh, it turns out in the end, the bioplastics industry is still a small industry. You know, probably less than about 5% of total plastics produ production is, is from uh, biosources. The number can vary a little bit depending on uh, who you talk to and what categories of plastics they include when they try to determine the percent that's coming from biosources. Uh, so it's still a very small, small portion, but definitely growing at a rapid rate. Uh, not only in the United States, but particularly in other parts of the world, such as in Europe. And there's even uh, companies that work conventionally will produce plastics from petroleum sources are now starting to look at bioplastics for at least a portion of their uh, products. So this is, this is uh, definitely an area that is, that is only going to grow in the future. Now the question is, is this actually a new concept? We've been using petroleum to make plastics and other types of polymers for the past 50 years or more. And uh, is, it, is it a new concept to think about alternative sources, particularly agricultural sources? And the answer to that question is, no, it actually is, is a very old concept. It turns out when people first uh, developed polymers and first realized that they existed, they were already considering uh, many different options for how to make such molecules. And petroleum was only one of those options. And back in the 40s, Henry Ford was a huge proponent of not only alternative energy, but also uh, alternative sources for polymers. And he, he was uh, a proponent for the use of soybeans to make plastics, uh, which were then used in, in some of his components of cars. And this is a historical photo of him uh, which he was actually doing uh, basically a press photo op for photographers so that they could take a picture of him swinging an axe at his car, which is made out of soybeans. At least the, the bump, the, the back bumper is made out of uh, soybeans. So he, he was a big, a big proponent of this area. And in the end, petroleum oils were so uh, abundant, seemingly endless uh, supply. Uh, people were able to uh, produce them for a very relatively low cost. So in the end, that, made, that was the more logical choice back in the day. And now people are starting to revisit this idea and think, you know, maybe we can start using uh, the agricultural sources as well. Uh, 
Another example is that of natural rubber, which of course is just a naturally produced polymer by uh, latex trees, and certainly that has been around for a century, for uh, centuries. What I'm going to do next is talk you through a number of case studies so that we can see some examples of commercially produced polymers and plastics, which are coming from agricultural source. And so I've decided to focus on uh, uh, plastics which are actually produced by companies and, and made into products today. And so you can get an idea of not only how the plastics are derived, how they're synthesized, also what some of the relevant properties are, and what you might find uh, some applications for these various materials. So the first case study is focused on polylactide. And I, as I mentioned uh, previously, polylactide is probably the most common polymer that, that people will focus on when they're interested in polymers sourced from uh, agriculture. And polylactide is actually produced from plant sugars. So currently, uh, corn is, is very popular in the United States, and so people are converting uh, corn, uh, the sugars from corn, can be converted to the lactic acid monomer. And that lactic acid monomer, uh, which is produced through a fermentation process, is then polymerized to the polymer, which is polylactide. And you can see the chemical structures of both the monomer and the polymer on the slide. Of course, in the end, uh, in order to produce this polymer, you actually don't have to use corn. You could use any source for sugars. And people are also interested in using uh, other sources such, such as sugarcane or maybe switchgrass if you can uh, figure out how to ferment that to the lactic acid monomer. Uh, so maybe something that doesn't uh, use as, quite as much land or grows more quickly uh, so you could make more of the material uh, on the same amount of land. Uh, but right now it's coming from corn. And this company, Nature Works, is actually headquartered in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and they have a manufacturing facility in Blair, uh, Nebraska. And they're pretty much producing this polymer at their full production capacity, so it's, it's been a very popular material. You can see some of the various uh, applications uh, that they focus on. Uh, things like uh, packaging are great to make uh, out of polylactide. It's a, it's a great fiber former, so you can make clothing. Uh, you know, so consider your synthetic types of uh, fibers which are normally used for clothing, like nylon. This, is, this would be a replacement for that. You can use it for carpet fibers as well. Uh, and then disposable products like cutlery, plates, uh, water bottles. There have been various companies who've commercialized water bottles made from this plastic. And so certainly there's, there's a lot of uh, areas which, which uh, currently today this plastic is being used for and, and very successfully. So what are the limitations of using polylactide? Why can't we just make everything out of polylactide and replace all of the other plastics? Well, it turns out uh, you have to have the right properties. And the current plastics, which are produced from petroleum, just have a very diverse set of properties, uh, things like mechanical properties or uh, thermal properties that just can't be replicated by one material from a bio source. And so this is a huge challenge, is how can we make a material that performs either as good or even better than the conventional plastics, but have it be uh, more environmentally friendly. And so that's, that's a huge challenge to implementing materials like polylactide. So it turns out polylactide has properties which are very similar to that of polystyrene. And you've probably encountered polystyrene uh, as it is the polymer that's used to make styrofoam. So uh, they're both very brittle polymers. And if, if you look at the slide, uh, you will see that there is a dog bone picture here. This is called a dog bone tensile bar. And the idea is to put this in a tensile testing machine where you actually pull on it, pull on both ends, and you look at how far can you stretch this material until it will break, and what's the force that's required to stretch that material. And the force that's required can be converted to the stress, which is on the y-axis of the plot, uh, through using the area. And the amount that you can stretch the material is converted to what's called the strain. And so this plot is we're plotting the stress versus the strain, which is basically plotting the force versus the amount that you've stretched it. And so it will break at a certain elongation or strain uh, and force. And so if you compare the different types of plastics, if we think about something like polystyrene or polylactide, uh, you're, you're really not able to increase the length all that much before it breaks, you know, somewhere around 3 to 5%. Uh, 
And if you compare that to polyethylene terephthalate or PET, which uh, everyone has encountered because it's the primary plastic that right now uh, water bottles are made from, that polymer, you can elongate it uh, to around 300% increase in its length before it breaks. And there's just a huge difference in the properties of, of polystyrene and polylactide compared to PET. So polylactide is a great alternative for polystyrene in some applications because it has very similar mechanical properties. But if we want to replace PET, we have to do something else to the material or find a new material. And what people are currently doing is they're finding ways to make polylactide tougher. And they do this by blending it or mixing it with additives and other materials, polymers, and other types of additives, which can actually uh, increase the amount that you can extend the polymer before it breaks. And people have found a lot of different successful approaches to doing this. And if, if, if they can do this successfully, what that means is that this polymer can be used for a lot more applications than it currently is. Another key property to highlight for polylactide is the biodegradability, and that's one way in which this material is really different from materials that are derived from petroleum. Polylactide uh, is biodegradable, so basically if you put it into an industrially managed compost, it will break down back to the lactic acid monomer, and eventually it will break, break back down to carbon dioxide and water, which is, are the original starting materials which the plants use to produce the sugars. And so it's, it comes through a full cycle back to the, to the components that were made, used to make the, the monomer and then the polymer. People can take advantage of this uh, in order to keep the polymer out of the landfills. So you can think about something like a water bottle that you use for a very short period of time and then you throw it away. So if you recycle it, that's great. Um, not everybody does. And so the question is, uh, is there other, other ways to handle the material? So this material uh, will also be uh, degradable in a compost. I should mention that a landfill is actually a terrible environment for biodegradation. So even things like paper, which, are, which is very biodegradable, don't really break down in a, comp in a landfill. And so polylactide uh, will not really biodegrade in a landfill, but it, but it will in a, in a compost, uh, just like you know, a, pa a paper would. So all of the same options are available for polylactide as compared to uh, you know, conventional plastics, you know, recycling, incinerating, landfilling, and then the additional option of composting for, for its end of life and how to, how to treat the material. Also, people will take advantage of the biodegradability of polymers like polylactide for biomedical applications. And an example of that is the resorbable sutures where you used to, when you, had, when you got stitches, you had to go back and they'd actually have to take the stitches out. Now, once you get stitches, uh, they'll just naturally uh, degrade away uh, when they're no longer needed. The second case study is that of polyurethanes, which are derived from vegetable oils like soybean oil. Polyurethanes are polymers which have alternating hard and soft segments. And there's a cartoon of this shown on the slide. So these soft segments are uh, molecules called polyols. And then the hard segments are molecules called diisocyanates. Currently, the big focus is to make the soft segments, or the polyols, from vegetable oils like soybean oil. You can see this general structure of a triglyceride. All vegetable oils have this triglyceride structure, where each triglyceride molecule has three fatty acids, which are just indica indicated as R1, R2, and R3 on the slide. So those R molecules are actually long fatty acids. They can be anywhere from you know, 12 to 22 carbons, approximately. And they have various uh, degrees of saturation, which means some of them have carbon-carbon uh, double bonds and some of them don't. And, and so those fatty acids are functionalized and converted to the polyols, and then the polyols are used to make polyurethanes. This process is also uh, being commercialized, and these, these materials are commercially available. A company called Cargill has this bio uh, brand of polyols, and you can see a picture of a shape memory foam pillow. If you look closely on the slide, you'll see this bio logo. So this pillow has some percentage of the bio-sourced uh, polyol that was used to make that shape memory foam. Polyurethanes have a lot of applications, and their properties can vary quite a bit depending on how the polymer is made. But you would see them in things such as uh, insulation for your house, 
furniture, any sort of soft uh, padding. If you sit on a chair with a cushion, likely it's made out of a polyurethane. Uh, things, uh, there are also adhesives and coatings, bedding, and so there's just a really wide range of, of uh, applications for them. The polyurethanes are often made into a foam, and you can see the structure of the foam on the slide. This is actually an example on the left is a foam which is made from traditional com components of a polyurethane, traditional polyol polyols and diastocyanates. And on the right, they've taken that polyol and replaced 30% of it with the soybean oil. And so you can see very similar foam structures in those two cases, the 0 and 30%. And what this is showing is that it's possible to make comparable materials uh, out of the soybean oil-derived polyols in some cases. The properties of polyurethanes are very uh, uh, varied, as I mentioned before, because depending on uh, what the chemical structure is of the soft and hard segments, you can really tune the properties and even of the bulk material or of the foam. And so you can have a very hard, rigid plastic to something that's very soft and flexible. And this picture on the slide is just showing uh, a shape memory foam uh, mattress, which is made out of this uh, soybean oil-derived polyurethane. The last case study is that of microbial polyesters, which are produced by microbes for energy storage. And from this picture, about 90% of that volume is the polymer, which would then have to be uh, harvested from the microorganism. And a company called Metabolix is commercializing this product. You can see some of the applications. Uh, one interesting one is shown on the bottom right, where you actually have a plant and the container the plant is in is actually made out of this polymer. And so this is a biodegradable polymer, just like polylactide. And so the idea is you can plant it right in the container. You don't have to get rid of the container. And the container is actually going to degrade away over time uh, in, in the soil. You can also make a lot of the same components that uh, are made from polylactide. And there's some uh, examples shown on the slide, such as adhesives, coatings. Again, these are good fiber formers you could make. Uh, carpet, you can make clothing, uh, you can make lots of different uh, disposable products like water bottles, uh, plates, that, that sort of thing. One thing that's really interesting about the microbial polyesters is that the chemical structure of the polymer that's formed actually depends greatly on what is used to feed the microorganisms. So what the food source is for the microorganisms will affect the chemical structure of the polymer. And so you can have a really big difference in the different polymers that are formed by those microorganisms, which means their physical properties can be very different. So whether it's brittle or tough, um, whether it's a soft material or a hard material, uh, all of those examples, they, they can be really different depending on exactly what type of microbial polyester you're talking about. Also, the microbial polyesters are all biodegradable and compostable, just like polylactide. And here you can see a really nice picture of how this material is degrading in a compost environment. And so there's a cup on the top, and there's a gift card from Target on the bottom. And you can see, after about a month, uh, definitely a significant fraction of the material has degraded. Uh, but certainly, it's not 100% gone. So in a matter of a few months, uh, generally, this material can be completely biodegraded in the compost environment. So now let's think about some of the critical challenges for implementing materials from agricultural sources. So the question is, this is great, but you know, why aren't all products made from sustainable resources? Why don't we just have a widespread shift to these agricultural sources and get away from petroleum as a source for polymers and plastics? And there are some very good reasons for why this, this transition is occurring slowly, uh, though it's certainly the number of these kind of plastics is growing every year. The, the first, most biggest uh, consideration is that of cost. Uh, in general, people will not pay more for a product just because it's sustainable. And so they, they want to see, uh, you know, it has to still have really good properties. It has to for, perform the same function. And also, uh, it can't really be a lot more expensive than what they're used to purchasing. And so that's, that's a, big, a big challenge uh, for these kind of materials. Another option to consider is that people will also not buy products if they don't perform as well as the conventional products. And so their physical properties of these polymers 
must either be the same as the conventional materials, and they also, in many cases, uh, if they're better than the conventional materials, that, that's, that's the, an even better scenario. And so I've mentioned some of the properties throughout this talk, but things like mechanical properties, uh, we've talked about tensile testing, for example, uh, thermal properties, is, does the polymer have a crystal structure, does it have a melting point, uh, is it glassy? Uh, the chemical properties, things like is it miscible when mixed with other plastics or is it immiscible? Uh, if you're adding various chemical additives to the plastic, can you still use them for this new type of plastic or do you have to go back and reformulate um, all of those pro parts of the process that go into making different products? Uh, things like the electrical product, uh, properties, are, is this a, a conductor, insulator, semiconductor? All of these are considerations for uh, for various applications of, of plastics. And so for the biosource plastics, uh, it's, it's really important that, that the properties are just as good as, as the petroleum source plastics. Finally, there's the question of, is this material really sustainable? So it's great that, that the source is coming from an agricultural source, but does that mean that the material is actually better for the environment than a petroleum source material? And it can be surprising that it's not always the case. And so what people need to do is what's called a life cycle analysis where they actually look at every part of the process used to make that plastic. And so you're including things like, do you, did you have to use chemicals and fertilizer to grow the crop? Uh, did you have transportation uh, energy costs? Did you have to move the crop around to get it to the plant in order to ferment uh, the sugars to form the monomer? Uh, did you? How, what happened to that material after it was disposed of? You know, did it go into a compost? Did it go into a landfill? And so you think about all of the requirements uh, of the, for making, producing, and disposing of that material, and then you can compare it this way. A uh, very um, a fair way of looking at this material versus more conventional materials. And usually, what they've seen, for example, with polylactide, there's still a benefit. Uh, the overall process is considered, and there's still a benefit to using that material. But it's not a zero-sum game. It's not 100% uh, better than, than the petroleum analog. And, and uh, so, for example, the energy requirements of processing that, processing that material into products are often higher than uh, the petroleum-based materials because those processes have been so well studied. And so people really have to think about, um, you know, is this material really sustainable? It's, it's not just obvious based on the agricultural source. So those are the challenges. Uh, but certainly there are, uh, you know, clear advantages to think about uh, for, you know, why we should still move forward and try to implement these materials. If we can overcome all of those challenges, it's generally thought of as being a good thing to, to try to use more of these materials. And so certainly, um, you know, the, just the fact that you're using an agricultural source and getting away from petroleum as a source for plastics um, is a good thing, as long as all of the other considerations that I mentioned on the previous slide, uh, you know, don't outweigh the benefit of the renewable source. There's also uh, usually a reduction in environmental emissions when you're moving away from a petroleum source to an agricultural source. So there's a lot of environmental emissions, uh, which uh, occur as a result of petroleum processing, and so you can you can avoid that completely uh, by using the agricultural source. And of course, the biodegradability is a huge advantage, uh, not only for the medical applications that I mentioned, but also to provide an additional option for disposing of the material, uh, which is to degrade them in a compost. So I've mentioned some of the considerations, the various factors to think about when, when thinking about uh, using these uh, uh, renewable resource plastics. But there are some other societal implications that we might want to think about as well. Uh, one of them, which, which is often raised when thinking about uh, biosource energy, such as biodiesel, is uh, this idea that now your materials, or in that case your energy, is actually competing with the food source. And so if we're using plant sugars like corn sugars or we're using vegetable oils like soybean oils, uh, corn and soybeans actually go into a large uh, portion of the food that, that our society eats today. And so the question is, if we really did have a widespread implementation of these plastics, uh, how much land would we actually need and, and would that divert land from food? Uh, plastics are about 7% of the uh, total usage of petroleum oils. 
And so it's a little more feasible to think about implementing plastics from agricultural sources than the whole uh, you know, need from petroleum, which is mainly diverted into energy. But it's still an important consideration, and, and certainly if we made all of our plastics from agricultural sources, this, this would be a problem. Uh, the second societal implication to think about is, is the environmental impact. And so there are many different ways to minimize the environmental impact of plastic. So you can think about a conventional uh, petroleum-derived plastic, and just by being able to change their process to use less energy to make that plastic, they're having a positive environmental impact. So, so it is possible to do the same for petroleum-based plastics. But in, uh, in biosource plastics, certainly avoiding petroleum processing is, is generally a good, uh, pos has a uh, positive impact on the environment. And finally, we might think about some political factors which would uh, affect our decision you know, to implement biosource plastics. So certainly petroleum uh, is not going to be running out in the near future, but uh, even though uh, the reserves are certainly decreasing over time, but it is also true that only parts of the world actually have access to petroleum sources and certain areas have more access than others. And so this is really a volatile situation that we're, as a society, dependent on certain areas of the world, which is not necessarily our own you know, land, for all of our energy and, so if, and, and materials. And so if we, can, if we can move away from that more volatile source for plastics, then we can, we can use something that we can grow uh, in, you know, on our own land, that, that could be an advantage. So uh, these are just some things to think about in terms of uh, how implementing uh, renewable resource plastics would actually impact our society. So in summary, there's a lot of interest and excitement surrounding making plastics and polymers from agricultural sources, things like plant sugars, vegetable oils, terpenes, polysaccharides, and microbial polyesters. And not only are people developing these ideas uh, at universities, but also there is a lot of commercial applications and all, companies all around the world are making products from these sources. Currently, the production of bioplastics is certainly a small percentage of the total, around 5% or less, but is growing at a rapid rate. And lots of companies are, are getting into this area of making a portion of their portfolio from biosources. I mentioned some of the challenges that have to be met, such as the cost of the material, their properties which need to be better or at least comparable to the traditional materials, and also the fact that we really do need to think about the full life cycle and evaluate how sustainable these materials really are. But certainly there, there are many potential rewards, such as mitigating environmental impacts, uh, reducing our dependence on volatile sources for raw materials, and also reducing plastics and, uh, you know, that are ending up in the landfills and also on land and in waterways and in places that, that we don't necessarily want them to be at the end of their useful lifetime. For the remainder of the slides, there is an example of a demonstration or an activity that can be done to highlight the difference in agriculturally sourced plastics versus conventional plastics. And this is a, is a demonstration using uh, packing peanuts, which, which you can get uh, from uh, various uh, shipping companies. And so you can find two different kinds of packing peanuts. Uh, one is uh, made from styrofoam and the other is made from starch. And packaging in general is uh, a term which is used for plastic that's used to transport goods. So you might think about you know, styrofoam containers for food. You might think about the plastic container that your you know, new cell phone came in. There are lots of different examples of this. And packaging generally, once we're done, once we buy that product and we're done with it, we usually toss it out. Maybe we can recycle it or it just ends up in the landfills. And so it can be a really big advantage to make packaging out of uh, biodegradable materials. So the, de the demonstration that you can try is just to first you need to find the two different types of packing peanuts. The one's made out of styrofoam and the second type is made out of uh, starch. 
And the idea is just to add those different types of peanuts uh, to a, a water, a glass of water. And just observe, you know, what happens to the styrofoam when it sits in the water versus what happens to the starch uh, packing peanuts and, and how is their behavior different. And finally, this slide gives a little bit of a uh, overview of the difference between the two types of peanuts. Uh, the styrofoam packing peanuts are not biodegradable. Uh, they're sourced from petroleum oils, and uh, you can see the chemical structure on the slide. And so they, they cannot be digested by microbes, and they generally end up in the landfills. Starch is a biodegradable material. You can see the typical uh, chemical structure where it's uh, composed of sugar molecules or glucose molecules, and it can be digested by microorganisms and biodegraded. And it comes from sources such as potatoes and corn.